So welcome to this seminar. It's a pleasure today to announce our speaker. She's actually a very distinguished person. She currently works as head of research and development in Nottingham, Ms. Dr. Maria Muda, but she also has a lot of firsts in her life. I think you are probably the first black person to win the L'Oreal uh, Prize of Women's Science, science possibly, and you know, very likely. Uh, she has also a huge experience on diversity and equality work uh, on several fronts. And uh, she's advisor on several bodies, uh, including Black Women in Science and also uh, Sandia Institute, correct me if I'm wrong. And it's really a pleasure that she could make it today. We have been trying to arrange it. We're both Brazilians, you know, so sometimes things get a bit out of hand. But we are very pleased that she accepted the invitation and we're really thankful that uh, she uh, is joining today. And she was also a professor in uh, Brazil, right, in Rio. So it's a fellow black professor. Uh, yes, and uh, I'm happy to give her uh, the word. And she's going to talk about research, culture, and sustainability, a case for diversity in science, and today, She's going to make the point not only about talking, not only uh, talking about this, but she's also going to state explicitly what doesn't work. So people have been talking a lot about diversity and equity and so on, and have been doing some crazy stuff, uh, which sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't work. And today she is going to talk about the possible pitfalls and what one could do to avoid it. So for those who are not even via Zoom, and there are quite a few of you, uh, I ask you to type your questions in the Q&A. We are trying to sort out the echoes here, but I don't know if you will be able to speak. Uh, so please uh, type your questions in the Q&A, and at the end of her talk, uh, we're going then to open the session. So are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Okay, so thank you very much for joining, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Maria, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Something else working for us. Yes, you know. But it's, uh, sorry, we are all a bit like this in front of you. It's not, let's not apologize too much, Anna. It's, it, it's good, it's 10 minutes, it's fashionable, Late, Fresh and we are going to exactly. make the most of, of of the time that we've got here together. It's really nice to be here at UCL. It's my my first time, my debut here, and um, it is definitely a place that is in the the collective unconsciousness when it comes to science, when it comes to innovation, to uh, really, really robust uh, STEM. Um, it's amazing to be here with you know one of my references in science, that is Carla, uh, a fellow Brazilian that achieved so much in, in, and continue to hold her authentic self. And I think that's what is really, really important about when we think about diversity in science diversity in research, diversity in academia, because it's not a matter of doing what is right, what is fair, but what is going to guarantee our survival. In the time of COP27, when we think so much about diversity and, and you know, that we are living today the warmest day on record in Scotland and Northern Ireland, one of the warmest in UK for November, uh, daily fever being transmitted in France. We've got everything going on that is showing us that the way we live is not correct. And the way we live, obviously, you know, trickles down to the way we live in research, in academia, in science. So I, these are reflections, and I think that what I'm going to talk here today are conversations that we are having together on and off to eat uh, and it's good to be in 3D in the room and virtually as well talking about um, these things. Um, I'm 
not an ETI specialist at all. I'm an ETI uh, enthusiast. And I say that because I'm in front of an ETI specialist that is uh, Diego Batista, that is our, oh, our, if you, our, because welcome belongs to everyone, isn't it? So he welcomes head of research, equi research and funding equity. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the wonderful things you do, if you don't mind. And I think that, you know, as he's just across the road, he would be someone wonderful to, to have here again. I'm sure that he's been before. Um, so I will take, I, I will take out of the equation uh, and I'll do a little disclaimer, okay? So if, uh, I'm going to, to tell you when you need to close your eyes, if you don't mind, the strong images. But, you know, yes, um, Carla was very kind to, to say one of, you know, some of the things that I've done. Um, some people would classify me as a failed academic. I left uh, the bench some time ago. I, because I realized that there were um, many more interesting things to, to, to do that I would be more useful doing things away from the bench because I love science. And if I could use you know, the very, very poor skills I've got to make other people's lives better in research, in science, I would. And that's what um, was a turning point in my life. Um, so, you know, I, I learned throughout time those secret handshakes that we need to have. However, and that's when you sh should close your eyes because I don't want to trigger anyone. If you don't like things that are a bit more extreme, I'm going to show you this image that is a, uh, uh, a cartoon from the 18th century. Uh, this cartoon is a cartoon. Uh, against making a case against slavery, against the slave trade. But you can see there is a woman right in the middle of the figure, if you have your eyes open. Uh, and that woman is my ancestor. I am the, the offspring of enslaved people that did the passage. That's me. And the way I think, the way I see the world is impacted by this transgenerational transgener experience. However, because of a number of um, things that happened by chance, I, I was able to enjoy, I keep using the other, I was able to enjoy a wonderful life both in Brazil and in UK. And, and it means a lot of fear, I know. And when I think about that, it's because, you know, some, some people, some people in my, in, in, some of my ancestors, they were able to make some choices. They, able, they were able to take some paths that made my life very, very different from the people that look like me, not only in Brazil, but 56% of the people are like me, despite, you no, know, people don't believe, but that's the truth, because they are very much in the margins of society, but here in UK as well. So I should not, and, and that's something that we see quite often, people um, making a case to, oh, you know, look at her. They, they made, anyone can make it. That's wrong. That's a fallacy. It's criminal to say that, but it's not the case. What is very, very sad as well is that we see, and when we manage to get to, 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 to have the life we want to have, we see that as a privilege when it's actually a right. And so all the distortions happen in this space. And you know, to be a, a bit more unicornian, I was able to have a child when I was finishing my BSc 
and it did not impact my progress, very much the opposite. I see that it was a, a propelling force to, to my career. Not every woman, no matter the ethnicity, the social status, can enjoy the right that I have. So enough of Maria, that's all, uh, there will be just sprinkles of Maria from now on. I would like us to take a journey and think of the landscape. And I'm so glad that I'm doing that live and I'm doing that you know, with people that are not necessarily ecologists. So can we see the difference between these two landscapes? You're good with patterns. So can you see the difference? Can anyone see the difference? What we've got here? Let's be open, interactive. I can, but I'm from the young people, so maybe I should shut up. Shut up. That's true, yeah. Fail, failing again. We've got a monoculture on the right, exactly. Thank you so much. And it would be awkward if no, nobody but Carla said <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, there is a monoculture on the right. And if we go from this um, these aerial uh, image and we go to the soil, we are going to, to find something very similar to this. So on the left, always on the left, we've got a very thriving uh, ecosystem. It's incredibly diverse. This diversity of species, flora, fauna, microbiome allows it to thrive and to be resilient and to be resistant. We see what happens in the Amazon forest, isn't it? How, you know, the attacks and how the, the forest reclaims the space because it's diverse, because it's resilient. On the right, we've got what some call a green desert. It's bare, it's poor. In the case of conifers or eucalyptus, they drain all the water they can from the well, it's very much, there is no exchange. Everyone here is for themselves. It's a system that encourages hoarding, that uh, inhibits cooperation between the species. And I think that it's a very good analogy to what we see in research in academia for, forever. We are in a society that is based on pillage, pillage, fighting, yeah, yeah. in hoarding, in, in, in segregating, in dividing. And we do exactly the same thing in academia, we do everything, every, exactly the same thing uh, in the research space. So if you go into more specific things, and I think that these are the main issues that we face in research, um, but you can change racism and misogyny with you know, the Brexit, xenophobia, we can, you can change for homophobia, for transphobia. These, all these things, they affect, and it would be good to discuss here with you, how does it affect science? So I think that another dimension would be to see this, this very um, Newtonian uh, problem and try to bring all the parameters, all the dimensions. How does it reflect the world demographic? Uh, I'm very careful in using this slide because the author of the book, um, Invisible Woman, it's a good book, brings some interesting reflection. Um, uh, it seems that there was some controversy that maybe she might have expressed some transphobic views. I'm not going to get there. But I've got something a bit more fundamental about the problem of the invisible woman that is correct, it is right, 
it exists. We see that we live in a world designed by men for men. And yes, star vests for men, car crashes, the, the safety belt designed for men. A woman would never have designed a safety belt the way it is designed because it's against our anatomy. It's not inclusive. But I would say, I would go further. I don't think that the world is designed for men. I think it's a very specific kind of man. What makes her observations a bit obsolete is Caucasian. It is cis male, the cis is someone that lives and have the phenotype of people living in the North Hemisphere, particularly in Europe and North America. Not the native North American people, neither. The people that invaded um, the Americas. So that's that. That's what who the world was designed for. When we do, and that's something that is very vivid for me. When I, I'm a pharmacologist, when I was training, and after as a technician, we wouldn't use female rats. When I asked my supervisor, we wouldn't. When I asked my supervisor, a woman, why don't we use female rats? Because they mask the experiments. All the hormones I worked with inflammation, they mask the experiments. And that's when we need to be careful. Oh, I'm a woman. How can you say that to me? How can you say that I'm being racist and misogynist? I'm a woman. A woman can be highly misogynistic and high, and a black person can be very racist because these phenomena have nothing to do with the phenotype of the individual. So I could have transmitted this knowledge and this practice that my supervisor learned, a woman, that learned probably from a man, but could have been from a, a pioneer woman as well, that we don't do experiments with female rats because they mess the results with all those hormones. So another interesting thing is that the people that the world is designed to and for, they comprise less than 90% of the population. I feel bad for saying these things because it's just the obvious. You are all much more intelligent than me and you can come with much more robust data, but you just need to Google and, you know, and divide and you're going to, try to find it out. Academia, when you see the numbers, in academia, people from any other ethnicity, the percentage, you know, they are dwarfed when it comes to their participation. And it has got a direct effect on the way we think, the way we process information, the way that we transmit knowledge. And I'm a pharmacologist. I like treatments. I like drugs. So malaria, we, every, it's interesting, every year, in a certain time of the, uh, it's usually post-summer, there is the announcement of a new vaccine for malaria. And everybody gets so excited. I think, I generally think that we're inching closer and co closer to an effective treatment, but extremely in a very, very slow pace, isn't it? I would argue, and I can maybe I'm being unfair, that it might have something to do with who malaria kills. Who malaria kills? Any idea who, who malaria kills? Black people. It's not only black people, it's black babies. It's black babies. We allow black babies to die 
without an effective way to control malaria. It's their problem. Interestingly, the advancement in some tropical uh, disease treatments, they come with the global warming, isn't it? I'm still very much under the impression the first case of dengue fever transmitted in the European continent in France. It is a huge thing because you see that it's inching and then you know everything that was neglected is now coming to bite the heels of of the the ruling the ruling powers. On the other hand, we've got an amazing, amazing inspector from the pharmacological perspective. It is so simple. It's so beautiful. Yeah, Viagra. But the thing is, it's not only um, the fact that it was found out, maybe in a serendipitous way, but everything, the machine that came to support the development, the sales, the establishment as uh, something that our national health services, they had there all the time. Imagine the same furry and determination for male contraceptive. So we can't disconnect these things. It's all very simple. And it happens that part of our time is to think about stuff. So I think that it's a good exercise for us to keep ourselves in check. So as uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, that is the woman that created the term intersectionality, says we need to address the intersectional failures of the past. When we see feminism excluding many women and catering for a very specific kind of women, and then we can go all the way to the, all the other combinations of protective characteristics or not, we, we need to address these intersectional failures. And we can, only, we can only do that and try that in the research of the system. And, and hopefully, we will be able to scale up for big, bigger groups and who knows in the future for the whole society if we are, if we deal it heads on one is two the time. Is everything okay? Should I continue? Yeah. Hopefully. Well if people are not here they miss it, isn't it? They you're yeah. supposed to be here with us. Yeah, it's, uh, can I continue? You can continue. I don't know what happened. I think it's the Wi-Fi that becomes strange here, but you should be fine. Yes, we are back. back. We are back. back. Yes. Great. But we can't deny that we are in a very, very interesting time. I grew up. My my activism was just being there, and that's something that my mom taught me, your activism is being there. There's no one like you. You are doing the activism, just being there. And I should confess, when I was someone you know, playing the game as a research active person, raising children, I didn't have the headspace. And that's why, is everything OK? Everything's OK. Yeah, I think it's fine. Um, I, and, and I'm very careful when you know it's just like every black person in the universe or every woman in the universe every member of the LGBTQIA plus community every member of the disabled community needs to be an activist they, they are already activists because they exist they exist in research they exist in science it, it should be enough but we are living this moment that things imagine having this special on nature just covering racism in the Black History Month. Yes. It is something, you know, and, and overcoming and facing, I think that the most important thing is facing the toxic legacy. Am I late?
Oh, you so, are fine. It's okay. just uh, we had some problems with the Wi-Fi here, but we are back. We are but, back. I mean, as you said, people should have been here. No, yeah. Well, sometimes people can't. I was just teasing. I understand. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you need anything? No, no, I'm fine. I'm good. We and you know, here is uh, Diego. I would put your photo, but then I thought that I shouldn't. But you know, Diego played a very, very important part with other colleagues in Welcome to support Jeremy Farrar to make the statement he did. Welcome is racist and not good, doing enough. Therefore, we are going to do a lot of things. And it's amazing, isn't it? You know, we search thunders tackling this. We need to take advantage of this movement. But what I think that we need to be very careful is that. Unfortunately, in the same moment that we have you know, very, very well-intentioned people in the EDI space, um, bringing innovation and real work, EDI became the, became the new HR. And people don't feel seen. And I keep telling at my University, University of Nottingham, I say that's for you because I tell my PPC for practice service and inclusion, everyone, there are, not, there are probably more people making money out of EDI than being benefited by EDI. And we can't allow it to happen. It is criminal. And that's, a, and you know, in, in all these movements, we see papers that are science advances, I think, paper showing the ecological and evolutionary consequence of systemic, systemic racism in, in urban environments. What we always saw now quantified, measured, studied with the rigor it deserves. It's really, I, I never thought I would see that in my lifetime, I should tell you. But then we thought, as I said, the people that are not taking advantage of it, and EDI in this uh, paper from earlier this year, uh, now play with the acronym, Endless Distraction and Inaction. Because there's so much talking, isn't it? Oh, yeah, no, no. And people doing like ethnographic, making more money. It's, it's, it's amazing how, how you can get money and exposure from, from, from people's pain in the end. And the people that are suffering the pain, they are not getting a very good deal. And I believe because justice has been alienated from the EDI agenda. There is this term, Jedi, that you know, the whole thing with, that justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, that I should stop using because some people don't like it. Sorry, PT. But I do like, I think that there, uh, there are many fellow geeks in the room. Um, and I like the Jedi, you know, it's, it's strong, but some people don't like it. And I think that we need to appreciate the reasons they think the term is not okay, particularly when we are talking about equity. But I think that the, one of the big problems we had is that just it was disenfranchised, was detached from the entire agenda. So, is it a matter of choice to be a minoritized person in STEM? And a little bit more personal perspective is my daughter, Malu, Malu Kusin, very strange person. So she did philosophy in Manchester. Some of you know the, 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 the preacher. Um, then she went to do um, MRS in biosciences in Nottingham, which she just, uh, came back to, to interrupt it for six months because she's now a journalist at BBC. My daughter's life does not reflect the life of 99.99% of Black young women in the UK. And I contrast this, you know, she, 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 she was raised inside the university. For her, professor is someone that she hugs and kisses and have, have over, it's not the, 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 there are so many things that we take for granted when we, the, when one is exposed to different experiences. And then we've got the amazing, mind-blowing Tommy Akinbadi, 
a force of nature from the height of her 24 or 23 years old. So I think she's one year older than my daughter, that's 23. Um, Tommy is the founder of Black Women in Science Network. More importantly, or as importantly, she was one of our students in Nottingham that graduated with a first in neuroscience in my former school. I know how difficult it is to get a, it is to get a first there. She did it, took two and a half years to get a PhD scholarship. Tommy worked at Harrods. She, to be closer to the bench, she worked as the assistant of the assistant of the assistant in the NHS routine lab during COVID. Then she became, she managed to get a place as, um, as uh, a technician in a lab here at UCL. And now she's doing her PhD in Cambridge. She created the, the Black Women in Science Network when still an undergraduate in her third, second or third year, because she couldn't see how she would fit the possibilities that science offered. How sad is it? And I think that Tommy was one of the great agents of my awakening to the problem and how we can't be passive to it. Once again, she's spectacular. She's far above mediocrity. And I want people to have the right to be mediocre. That's what I want for everyone, to be mediocre and thrive. You don't need to be Tommy to do it. And he's another I need to, I'm getting so, I'm getting too comfortable here talking to you, so I'm going to speed things up a bit. That's a, a, another, pardon? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, the, in, I don't want to bore people, uh, but that's another paper from this year. You know, we need to take advantage of these periods so desperately, otherwise we, we miss the momentum. The intersectional privilege of white, able-bodied, heterosexual men in STEM. Pardon? No, bear with me. So it's just because the man is in the very, in the very, you see the black box, um, men without disabilities, able body, you know, everything going on. So it's the base. And she did this matrix and it's got nothing to do with the person. It's the groups, and I think that's something really, really important. I am married to a heterosexual, white, able-bodied man. Um, heterosexual, as far as I know. Um, and I, I love him to bits. It's nothing to do with the person, it's the phenomenon that we observe. So we've got black, um, uh, white men without disabilities, heterosexual, and then we've got the yellow box is white women without disabilities and heterosexual, then heterosexual men without disabilities. And then you can go all the way down and be in this red box. We've got heterosexual black women without disabilities in STEM. It is quantified. And this group, it happens I'm part of it, but I'm taking, as I said before, Right in the beginning, I'm taking myself from this equation. This group is followed by people of color that are uh, members of the LGBTQIA plus community and or disabled. That's, uh, that's the, the whole thing. And then she goes further in her analysis. So I'm just going to ask you to look at the white, um, part of the graph, the, the white part of the bars. When it comes to social inclusion, harassment, professional respect, these three um, that rank higher, more than 80% of the differences can't be explained by any other factor other than discrimination. At the same time, 
this paper, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 2019-2020, brought to us that analyzing, just like she analyzed 20, over 25,000 people in STEM, this one is something is in, the, in the tens of thousands as well. Uh, actually, nearly all US PhD recipients and their dissertation across three decades. So they produced this study that proved that women and ethnic minorities, they innovate more, but their innovation is not taken by the system. It does not reflect in more publication. It does not reflect in their continuation in academia, despite the, so actually what we are doing, we are putting people out that could help academia to solve some of the problems that we're facing today. And that's why I believe that we need a blueprint for diversity in high performance research setting. We are not talking about, oh, let's, let's do the right thing. Let's put more people inside. And they, you know, we bless them. They are not that good, but we're doing the right thing. It's not the point. The point is we need the diversity because it's going to help us to do better science, a science that is going to, to, to empower, to, to propel us. Uh, towards a more uh, prosperous future. That's it. There's no, there's nothing good or benevolent in it. So I think that instead of thinking about equality and inclusion, it is time to think about abolition and liberation. We need to abolish these practices that brought us where we are, and we need to liberate and emancipate people to fulfill this potential because it will bring back results to the system. We also need to rethink excellence. And rethinking excellence, we need to reinvent the research of the system. We need to tell another story. We can't, the foundations, they are rotten. We don't have the luxury of destroying everything, but we should, and then look at you, Diego, we should you know, use what is left from the old foundations to build new, stronger ones. I think that we can use empathy as a strategic tool. We should unleash creativity. We should and we need to democratize opportunities. It's time to be responsible and accountable. It's time to be responsible for people's emancipation. Our PhD student or your PhD is not your PhD student, is someone that you are having the privilege to nurture, to continue your legacy and do something better with it. Wherever they are, in academia, in industry, in government. And thinking about that, you know, as you can see here, there's no novelty. I'm not saying, I'm not claiming anything. These are the thinking behind Maria Montessori, the, uh, that, that Maria Montessori brought, that Paulo Freire, the guru of the education, Brazilian, by the way, brought us. I am, I feel so, and I'm going to use privileged. I know what is right, and I know it's free. I'm privileged to have the network I, I've got, and see so many of you here that I've been joining the company and the friendship. Uh, this is another amazing, uh, collaboration that we've got, that is the I Care for Justice, is the acronym, is an initiative with a Dutch consortium, the University of Connecticut, to rethink justice, particularly race equity in higher education, from undergrad all the way to faculty members. And more recently, um, with a number of amazing people, over 30 people, we tried to, we put something forward that we knew we knew would flaw, and it's okay. That is how, how we see we can re start reinventing 
the research ecosystem. We can't do one thing here, one thing there, as we do because that's what the resources we got. We, there is case to bring evaluation, theory, think of, of the research ecosystem as an ecological space and transform all that in strategy and, and, and policy friendly um, content to be rapidly used. And to do that, so having these pillars to start to process information, the information will come from some very simple questions that we discuss here today. Who does and or enable research? Why do we do research? How do we do research? These are the problems we've got today. And these are the answers we need to answer, the, the questions we need to answer. And if you've got an approach that, uh, that allows us to integrate evidence evaluation implementation to critical intersectional theory to understanding and what, what, looking at the system as an ecosystem, because it is, we've got predators, we've got, we've got commensals, we've got the whole thing, and, di and, and digest it so fast that we can produce outputs to give to policymakers as we speak. It would be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, it's a new way of doing things. So you need to have capacity development supporting the, the researchers, the, the co-investigators, but the students, the postdoctoral fellows to think this way. And most importantly, we need to co-create, co-design, and co-produce with the communities that are going to be the beneficiaries of it. So we've got a network, and I'm sure that you know, in a new incarnation of this um, of this dream, UCL will definitely be with us. So we've got here the universities uh, of Nottingham, Nottingham, and Nottingham Trent the Research and Research Institute, and uh, that is in Sheffield, Cambridge with Rachel Oliver, that many of you know, Glasgow um, with Jason Arde that had his inaugural kindly brought to us by Diego, again, <laughs> uh, here at the Welcome uh, Collection a few weeks ago, uh, Manchester, Oxford, Surrey, and the Sangay Institute. And, among the delivery partners, because you know, if you think about the ecosystem, the ecosystem is not only the people that produce knowledge. We we need delivery partners, and he's Black Women Science Blast and the the consortium um, from the Netherlands. But here, very importantly, we've got the funders, and I'm so very grateful, you know, in our you know for the partnership and support from Welcome Trust and the NIHR in thinking this. That's the thing, the partnership is in the thinking. And a number of international organizations as well, because we, we don't live alone. And, in, and we've got a track record in doing that. So when I say we, it's not the royal we, it's the real we, people in this consortium. So you've got Stacey Johnson, that is the person that really took off with the uh, reverse mentoring programs. We've got uh, the programs from the Sangha Institute that are for more postdoctoral fellows. We've got um, uh, the science science programs that I need for undergrads to get into research um, and, and from other institutions as well. And the excellent science is, is, is a very um, interesting case. It's, it's right in the beginning of the, of the journey when we, that was really inspired by uh, my experience as a black, a, a black uh, academic receiving the first cohort of positive action students in Brazil. These students, they were so, they were ostracized, they were mistreated. They don't know enough. They don't. And here, these are 
the uh, three of the many PhD people that went in that cohort that I taught pharmacology when they were in the second, third year that went all the way to become PhD, um, uh, PhD students and now uh, research in their own right. Um, and it is, they are very, I put because they are striking and they are beautiful and they are very exuberant. There are many others equally exuberant and beautiful. Um, but to, to show that it works when you've got positive action, mindful positive action, mindful scientific initiation, bring that social, that, that capital, that, that, that flair of, of walking around in science without fear and terror, it works. Um, it also works to pay people to do that because there's nothing as unfair. And if there's anything that you get home from Maria talking like crazy, never ever accept someone in your lab without a scholarship. That's the worst thing that you can do. That we don't, see, and I didn't see that before, but the inequality that you create in that moment is what makes our system what it is. And I say that as the mother of someone that's like, oh, you know, go there, shadow them. You know, you don't need this scholarship. Just go, 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 shadow. How unfair is it? So these students, they are, we have a, a intersectional matrix and we select them according to their outputs, but also um, the, um, the level of disadvantage. We've got mental configurators, I'm not going through that, but exercise one of them, uh, Ignite Future, and the Blast Fest UK, and the Black Human Design. And there is the beautiful Sang Excellence Fellowship that I'm just dropping it here so you can invite Sayu to come and talk to you because uh, it was just a, a honor and a privilege to support them in this journey that took to the creation of the Sanger uh, Fellowship. I always say that these programs, they are Trojan horses rather than, it's not about, it's not as much about the people that get into science, the public is great support, but the transformation that you create in the ecosystem when they are there. And it was a very mindful program. Um, and we are the beautiful people that uh, are part of the inaugural court. And Saia, um, you know, her, her vision, determination in um, aligning recruitment, mentorship, leadership, and culture. Um, and with the support of key stakeholders, both myself and Diego and many other colleagues are part of the advisory group. It was a really inspiring experience. Finishing now, that's that's the deal. That's the world we fought. It's it's hunger, it's fear, it's wars, it's climate change, it's violence, it's plastic in the ocean, um, it's COVID. But we need to, we need all hands on that. And we are letting good hands um, away from science. They are going to be okay. These people are resilient. We are the ones losing it. Um, and here's uh, 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 something I took from um, Toni Morrison's book, Beloved. And uh, it's a, uh, Christmas, a black, it's a marooned community in the middle of the of the one of those forests in the US, you know, hiding and, um, and seeking spiritual comfort in their in their uh, journey towards freedom. And she says she told them that the only grace they could have was the grace they could imagine. That if they could not see it they would not have it. So that's the, the, uh, the other invitation that we continue this conversation. We continue dreaming together. We continue thinking together, uh, critiquing each other in love and compassion because we are all in a journey here. 
Um, and with that, um, something that is very close to us, um, an image that means more to Brazilians than it means to other people around the world. But we've got the reasons to believe that hope defeats terror and that it is all we need to do is to work. Isn't it good that when all we need to do is work, work together towards a better future? So thank you so, so much, Ubuntu. I am because you are. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I think it's, it has inspired a lot of people. Uh, are there questions, comments? Yes, uh, go ahead. We have a microphone. Yeah, we do this. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know whether this is on, but <laughs> um, one of the things you mentioned that, that really struck a chord is the, the kind of EDI industry, the uh, tendency towards distraction and inaction, and, and the fact that our institutions. They, they create a lot of barriers, which at first it looks like they're engaging, but actually what they're really doing is just bogging everything down and creating that. So, so, so I wondered whether you had sort of practical advice on how to deal with this phenomenon, because it seems to be so ubiquitous. Thank you very much for your question. Very, very deep one. Um, I think we we are in different places, isn't it? And in different, you know, our sphere of influence is something that sometimes we can't control. I think that it's about calling out. It's about just saying, and you just say, you're not fighting, you're not um, antagonizing, you're just stating the facts. And I think that's something really, really powerful. So, Sometimes in my own institution, what I do, and I do that in a, in the, it happens that I am right now when I'm not going to be for much longer chair of the Bain staff network. Um, I have access to some meetings that most of my colleagues don't because of my day job. And that's where I just say it. We just say, no, you, you observe the, the issue. I, I, I had a very, a very telling uh, experience this week. Actually, it's a long experience. And they reached that point that we just need to say it. With a smile on the face, that's what is happening. It can't continue this way. We are making fool of ourselves. And then you say that, and, and usually it's not going to sort out the first time, but then it becomes a mantra. And you take that mantra, wherever you are, you just say it again, and you say it again. And other people listen. The people that first said, oh, oh here she comes, here he comes again. They said, actually, there's something here. And, they, and, and it's part of the education of the ecosystem as well, to feel, um, to feel empowered to make the questions because we are, we are in a, in a in an environment that there is a lot of discourse, but it's a very specific kind of discourse that is encouraged. I don't know if I answer your question, but are we are on the same it? we are on the same boat. Yeah. What I would say, it's a mantra. You just repeat and you repeat again, you repeat again. <laughs> Uh, there were, there were, yeah, he then. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there's other things where we can tell these bodies to be like, okay, you can you should put your money where your mouth is, right? Because there's a thing with nature, they have extortion, I mean, enormous amounts of, uh, I mean, to publish in nature, it's very, very expensive, right? Yeah. And a lot of institutions that are not in Europe and not in North America can't afford to actually publish in nature. So I'm, I don't know if you might know more than, more than me on this because you published in nature. Um, do they, have they kind of, Reduced fees or wipe the fees for, for these kind of uh, uh, 
uh, like African institutions and stuff and stuff or is it the same? I like this game some time ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I don't I I I don't, maybe now because you know there is this this awakening they might have something like that. Uh, I I still don't think it's the I, I don't think it's enough and even if they waive the fees, I think that is a whole education. Yeah. So as a South American researcher, so how many times without knowing me, without seeing my face, if they saw that was correct, never mind. Never mind. I, mean, I get nasty refer reports all the time, and sometimes editors reject my work like straight ahead if they see just by seeing my name and some Brazilian people from the south. Because you can see from my name that I'm from the north. So imagine now the situation if, and I'm, I'm here at UCL, top university. Imagine now the situation of someone from Brazil uh, applying and, and submitting mm -hmm. something for a journal. But you know, I, I agree. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you that it's it's too little, too late. Bit, well, not, it's never too late. And they, people, and that's the thing people are nice nature the problem is our systems and institutions isn't it and i i think that it's still how how can you change things if you don't change the way referees are going to assess papers and how much it costs and who is going to read the paper it, 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 we we take for granted that our institutions have access to almost every article in the universe Many people don't. When I was in Brazil, how many times I would ask colleagues in Europe and US to send me the papers, the PDFs? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. The mic's finally made it towards me. So um, <laughs> I'm trying to resist making a white privilege joke about the fact that I can now hold the microphone. Um, <laughs> one of the things that struck me on, on the, the list where you're showing the the eight, eight and a half or eight point eight percent um, within that small category of white male North American. To me, there's an even further subdivision that's missing, and that's wealth. And coming out of um, cancer, which is probably where I work in these days, um, looking at the distribution of the areas where funding is 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 spent, it disproportionately. Um, Funding seems to be spent on prostate cancer, and that I can't understand. You're you're moving away from um, anything that predominantly affects the young, something that predominantly affects the old, yeah. and predominantly affects the wealthy. Yeah. So um, the the only thing that I would caution is that not taking that into account as well. Wealth can buy you a route in if you are disadvantaged in all those other ways and can also exclude you even if you're within that, that privileged group. Um, the thing that I wanted to ask is, one of the things that seems to come most strongly out of the Me Too movement is about advocacy, is about those who are in the majority also standing up for those in the, the minority. And I wanted to get your perspective on that because clearly, clearly in this field, I'm in the majority. So it is then where energies are best spent to advocate in the best way, not just in a structural way, but if one sees discrimination occurring, to then make sure that it's um, confronted. Um, calling out your voice, it's a fact just a fact your voice what is it is more value more valuable more more it's better heard than my voice it is just a fact it, it's something that we and we can you don't need to feel bad about it because it has nothing to do with you specifically it's how the system is your voice in this system unfortunately is louder than my voice you calling out decisively has a much it has a big impact i think that there is a lot of hesitancy and discomfort in the conversations 
So that's my, my PVC for EDI. She's a lovely woman. She's very, very competent. Um, but we had uh, a round table um, a few months ago and there is the thing of the comfort and not exposing yourself. So what is discomfort compared to pain? And I made the analogy of the mask that you're using and maybe you should all use more. The mask is a very good example, isn't it? The, the tiny discomfort of using a mask has been shouted as, as a, an attack on civil liberties when actually we are defending the whole system from something that can be horrendous. And I think that's a bit of the, the conversation about misogyny and races in any environment. I think that's, the, that's what helps me to think because I, am, I, I, I want to be a better ally where I can as well when it comes to LGBTQI plus um, causes, when it comes to disability, to neurodiversity, I want to be better. And then one can think, but I don't, is it really, is it, was it really discrimination? And, and then we, I think that that's the thing, we can't, we can't give bigotry the benefit of the doubt and bigotry, happens in different levels, isn't it? You need to be called out, called out with love, with compassion, but you need and as, as quickly as possible as well. I think that's the best thing. And what, what you talked before, I totally agree. And some people think it's, think it's discomfortable to talk about whiteness. Whiteness is a condition, is a societal disease that has many things. Whiteness is not good for most white people. It's bad for white people. It's bad particularly to white people from less affluent backgrounds. But it's a fallacy that keeps people uh, not defending their own interests. It's a fallacy that allows governments like the one we've got now and the one that we've got in Brazil and that is happening across Europe. That's that's the, the, the fallacy of the thing. And then people think it's, it's okay with this uh, the prostate cancer. And you know, it's for old people. They are the voters, isn't it? In this country, particularly, uh, or old white people. But now that you know, only 10, uh, 100,000 people decide the fate of the country, they are even more powerful. Um, and everybody's okay with it. You don't see the young, revolting, you don't see women, uh, most of the women, they are okay about it, they don't make a fuss. And I think that is this, because it plays, it plays with the imaginary thing of the, of the whiteness. There are cancers that have, affect some communities more than others, isn't it? That are not, um, or even the same kind of disease in this, in cancer that is seen and assessed in a different way. So I know nothing about that. I am not a cancer biologist, but uh, colleagues that work uh, with, is it triple negative? Cancer that is, has a, a, is overexpressed or in, in black women. Yeah. Is it? That they, they just die and affect everyone, but it, they, it's not diagnosed, it's not treated and they just die. So I think, I think that it begs the, the reflection of even, and I agree with you, the, 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 the affluency, but the whole whiteness thing is that people, they feel they are in the same boat when they are not. And that's devastating for the society. Um, we have some questions also from, I don't know how the microphone situation here is, so I'll, I'll speak closer. We have some questions also from the people online, and uh, I'll just read them out. So the first one is from Mieto. Um, sorry, I need this. From Mieto uh, Simeonidis, thank you so much for your inspirational talk. Do you feel that progress is happening too slowly? And if yes, why is that, do you think? 
it, thank, thank you very much for the kind words. And yes, it's very slowly um, because nobody wants to give up power. Who wants to give up power? It, we, we, were, we were raised to, to hoard, to secure power, to you know, hold it um, firmly and don't give away how it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's strange. That's why I don't, I, I don't like to talk about justice. Um, only, uh, I that, that is important, but nobody is going to change. The, the systems won't change because of justice. They will change because people see how disadvantaged they are being. Um, but yeah, I think that it, we, we need to flip, we need to be better advertisers maybe. Yeah, I mean, he's asking also, is it because a lot of people do not believe there is a problem? Yeah, I think so. And there is a lot of survivor, survival bias as well. I mean, even the people uh, that hold the characteristics that would be, um, and that, you know, I'm not an EDI specialist. There's so much more to talk about it. That's why I'm pushing, you know, have to be able to talk in another, in another seminar. Um, yeah, I am. Yeah, I think that people don't see a problem or they see there is a problem, it's too much hassle to, to go and try to solve it because they've got other things to do and I can't blame them. Uh, another thing that, I mean, I saw in your talk that you talked about intersectionality, you touched upon that. Uh, what about the situation of women in general? Let's say white feminism. What would be your critique on white feminism? Who oh, am I to have a critique? I've got my own views. Yeah, your own views. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't need to be a critique. Um, that's the thing. It's, it's separating people, isn't it? Uh, we, we woke up with the news that 80% more women voted for Republicans in the US. How can, you, how can you make... You couldn't make it up, could you? What, what uh, there, there is a rhetoric that people need to protect what they've got and they are not keen to share. And I think that uh, white feminism, as you know, some call or, you know, the, the feminist disenfranchised the black community, the Latinx communities, the, the Asian communities, because it's a, it's a very narrow kind of families for things that are not valuable for everyone that does not um, bring context. And it's, it's, it's an intersectional failure. And when you see women in science, we, we see that. We, we, we see that, you know, oh, if you've got to you know, it doesn't matter if it's white women, it's women in science. So it, it, it's a, and, and I think that there is a, the, the allyship and how you position, how one put, position themselves in, in these stories, isn't it? You can, there is a, yeah, I think that, it, it, no, as I said, though, the, the whole thing, there, well, there'll be another name for it, but the name we've got today is, is the whiteness as a phenomenon, is, is something really, really damaging for everyone particularly in science. Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, I really thank you for this inspiring talk and for taking the trouble to come here and talk to us. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. And, you know, my contacts are everywhere. It would be lovely to continue the conversations. It's, yeah. It doesn't need to stop here. <laughs> it doesn't need to stop here. If you want to join us in the Houseman, uh, to, to have a coffee, a beer, whatever you would like and continue the conversation. The two of us are going then to have a beer because we need to celebrate Lula's win, right? Exactly, you can see in my, my profile picture on- uh, And it's the same. <laughs> yes, on Zoom, uh, because uh, we managed to keep the far right uh, from Brazil. Just, 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 just still. But so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time uh, to come here and listening to Dr. Aruda. I really appreciate also that you took the time and effort to come here to UCL. 
pleasure. And take care, everyone. So